Someone's definitely broken in and trashed the place, kids. No, we're not oh. playing. Oh. And we're back to rushing out the house. We haven't done that for weeks and weeks. We are off to Junior Park Run on Jersey. I don't know if I want to go swimming or not, because if I go, I might get cold. We're going for it. It's going to be cold. We're going to realise it's a bad idea as soon as we do it. But if we don't do it, then we'll forever regret it. That's our mantra. You'll have to take my word for it that we had a lovely swim as Hugh decided to film this car boat bus thing instead. We had our lunch and then off out again. We're going to the castle. We have to cross the bay and the tide is out so we can walk. It's called a causeway. Elizabeth Castle is made up of three islands joined together through the years. It presents a history of St. Helier, dating back to a hermit monk who lived on the furthest island in AD 550 until his head was chopped off by Norman pirates. Elizabeth Castle is an island fortress built across 24 acres and 15 centuries, from the time of that monk to medieval times, through to the Elizabethan period and the Second World War when the island was occupied. A number of Georgian buildings house exhibitions on two floors. Whilst visiting these exhibitions, we got trapped in by a storm. This is incredible. You could see the gust coming across the sea. It looked like a wave coming. It looked like, like an action film with tsunami. It was just white haze over the water. You could see it coming. And Let's suddenly... go. Oh break. God, we're gonna break in the weather. Let's get down to the Elizabeth's um, tower. Walk smart, not hard. Yeah, that old saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great adventure. Absolute carnage. Oh, oh, the cannons are in. Fleeing for our lives. We had been warned that it was coming, as the castle was due to close early, as it would be too windy for that boat car bus thing. All back to the boat for a nice quiet calm down. Good morning, another Monday morning rolls around and we are stuck in Jersey we think. Today's the day we're supposed to leave Jersey and ideally we we're gonna do a hop up to either Guernsey Alderney and then tomorrow do the hop over to England but the weather we're not quite sure. It was blowing a hooly googly last night. As always, our life is completely governed by the weather. I think Kelly and I are both looking forward to having a break from uh, checking XC weather and windy apps every day. That's what we do at the moment. But uh, yeah, in a few weeks when we're back and settled, we have a bit of time off that. Anyway, just popped over to the tool station, Norman's, got the right size hole saw, and I'm going to finally mount the autopilot header unit thing. Three and a half inch, 89 mil. Perfect fit. Perfect fit. So as always, I spent a great deal of time on the detail. Got it perfectly lined up, I'm happy with the position. I've lost one of the screws, but it doesn't matter. It's all gunked in, watertight. I'm just gonna put it back together now and uh, job done. So this isn't the end of the trip that any of us really wanted, but um, Calvin's leaving us. A few weeks ago, I got a foot injury, been limping around, hoping for it to clear up and it hadn't cleared up. 
So I got to the hospital here in Jersey and I got a hematoma on the ball of my foot. So I've been given a load of medication to sort it out and being that we haven't got a direct window to get back from Jersey to England, it's just easier for me to get a flight this afternoon and head home. Yeah, also it's hard to know because we might there might be enough window tomorrow, but it's a bit tight in these things. And but not only that, it's also with the boat moving. This is what's this is what's prolonged, well, isn't it? You you well. getting stuck in and helping? Well, I can't help. And yeah, it's uh, just sad. Yeah. Just like the Titanic, never make it back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't mean like that. You worry, mate. I was just trying to think of an example of something that hadn't sailed by left. <laughs> yeah, it's very much like the Titanic. Just like the Titanic. <laughs> Push pineapple, shake the tree. Push pineapple, grab your feet. To the left, to the right, jump on down into the knees. Going down, every night to the moon. Feel like I've abandoned you. No, you haven't. What about that? Yeah, feel like I've not finished the trip. No, well, you got back to to. Jersey. Jersey. Back to the UK oh. territories. Yeah. Yeah. You got as far as the Germans got. <laughs> <laughs> Another inappropriate joke in a poor attempt to lighten the mood. Bye. 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 We're all seeing, uh, we're all feeling very sad and melancholy without Kelvin here. The whole thing was a bit, happened a bit fast, a bit of a shock. He sort of, we knew he'd had this foot injury for a few weeks, but it wasn't really until yesterday that he said, this is pretty bad and I need to, it's not getting better, I need to go to see someone about it. Yeah, it was really sort of, especially for Kelvin, you can see he was really torn. He thought, well, I could just sit this out and just, I've got this far. And yeah, we're feeling pretty bad. But the thing is, it could easily be another week or so of knocking around and I'm not very good at night sleeps and putting lots of weight and work on his foot when actually another week he could well be well on the way to getting it mended and another couple of weeks after that he'll be up back doing his runs and his Joe Wicks and all these things so it's what it is but we think he's getting on the plane about now yeah we're a bit sad anyway I'm making some tea for the kids I've got a bit of online teaching to do um, and then we've got to start working out the weather's starting to clear up now um, and we need to work out when we're going to get out of here and how and where we're going to go next. As it happens, his flight was cancelled and the airline put him up in a hotel for the night. They also gave him 250 quid. And ironically, it looked as if we were going to be leaving the island before him. It's, uh, on one side, it's probably been quite nice just to have time just for family again. But Kelvin has always been a big part of this family. Um, but it's been very, uh, very full on having him here every day. And I think he'd say the same. I think he's used to his peace and quiet. But it's also worked really well. He's, uh, have all the people you can have live with you in a very small environment for eight weeks. I think Kelvin's one of the best. He's very self-contained, uh, just sits quietly doing his own thing and then suddenly busts out a song and brings the mood up. And also what he's great at is getting a job done. Me and Kel are going, well, who's going to empty the bins now? Who's going to go and fill up the water tank? Who's going to sort the electric out? So all these little jobs that Kelvin's just carved a little niche for himself and found roles to do, which are really helpful. Uh, keeping the boat running, we've now got to uh, pick up the slack, let alone uh, just things like having someone else to take a watch. It's useful we've got Gandalf, so that's a, that's, we wouldn't be able to carry on probably very comfortably without that now. But anyway, we shall see how we get on for the very final bits of this trip now, uh, just as an actual five coast sailing. So here we go for a day of punching tides, but uh, hopefully making a little bit of progress northward and back towards Southampton. Punching tides means we would be sailing against the tide, which isn't a great plan. But in order to make it to the Old New Race for what is known as the first of the favourable tides, meaning the time at which the tide turns in our favour, this was the only solution we could see. As we now realise, this was a terrible plan, so the only thing to do was to turn around and go back to Jersey and forget it ever happened with a visit to the museum.
This is Jersey's Maritime Museum, which looks really dull on the outside, but on the inside is fantastic. I'm such a sucker for old photographs. One picture can tell a million different stories. The kids then went and exchanged their euros for pounds, only to realise you can't spend Jersey notes in the UK. Spiced apple and pear chutney, apple chutney, can't get much better than that. And pickles! Because he doesn't! Doing the ordinary race tomorrow and most likely also the channel and I'd check the diesel level. And this one's completely full because we only use another one and then the valves which I've shut it off with have all worked. So whatever happens we've definitely got over 300 litres in this tank which is enough to motor for 60 hours. So that's like five, six channel crossings so we're good. Just doing some engine checks and checks all the things and one of the things we're doing is checking the water filter and it looks like we've caught a shrimp, we've caught a shrimp in the water filter. I don't think it is a lie. Oh. Oh. It is Wednesday evening here in Jersey. I'm here. Kelly's here. I am. We are passage planning. Just found Hugh's secret stash. He's got a secret stash of fruit pastels. My secret stash of fruit pastels are thinking ahead. I'm thinking at two o'clock in the morning on the 22nd hour of our passage. So I just got them as an emergency stash. I am gonna to have to remove my stash and hide it in another place. The rough gut plan is we're gonna leave here at six o'clock tomorrow morning, on Thursday morning, and we're gonna arrive, hopefully back in home waters, about midnight, two o'clock in the morning, uh, as a rough plan on uh, early hours on Friday morning, which is quite exciting. We've been watching the weather for days. Timing this all new race. My, well, I thought about it a couple of days ago, and when we tried to go out the other day, we did it wrong. We went so we'd arrive at the ordinary race at the first of the favourable tide, which meant we'd had, we'd have had over 30 miles against the tide to get there. Um, it never seemed right to me. I always sort of had this idea that we should arrive at the ordinary race at the last of the favourable tide, but then have the tide helping us all the way up there. But everything about the pilot books, everything from uh, Vic who taught us our yacht master theory, was all about always get to the high point at the first of the favourable tide if you can, but. I thought about it, you know, if we're going to the Needles Channel, I've done that enough times, and I'd happily do that on the last of the ebb. Um, but I just sort of got nervous and got worried, and we went out at the wrong time. Got some great advice from the hub master, and he's um, used to be a delivery skipper, and he's done this run loads and loads of times. And he said very clearly, just you want to get to the corner of uh, the island here in Jersey at high water, so you want to leave here about an hour and a half before high water. And he says, if you do that, and you'll just be in time to hit the race quite nicely and you get the flow all the way up towards Orny Race and you should get to Orny Race pretty much on slack water at the end of uh, the race but the water should be slack again just before it goes the other way so with the tide we should be getting about 8 knots which is going to, should time it perfectly for us to get there bang on 11.30 um, and if that's the case another 10-12 hours should see us up into the Isle of Wight for about midnight which is quite cool Could have worked out if we're before 10 o'clock, we'll go by the needles. If we're after 10 o'clock in the evening, we're going around the Benbridge Ledge. Got that? Right. But the thing about that decision, right, if we've got to make that decision about midday lunch time, 10 hours or so before that point, and that's to do with the heading we're going to take going across the English Channel, we've also got to make sure we pass the shipping lanes at the right angle as well. So all that matters. We know the boat's safe and well founded. Um, we know what the weather's going to do. We know what the tide's going to do. We've got enough experience on board um, and the boat's really solid safe boat so yeah we should hopefully fingers crossed have a great uh, great passage tomorrow um we've been looking at the forecast the last half an hour uh in bed it's deteriorated overnight a bit worse um it's been a bit of a tough call to be honest but the whole week's just shit weather uh the sleeper next door especially doing biscay it's pulled it off um but he's a 
at least with, with us. Um, there's a bit of a period, the first three or four hours are going to be a bit tough though. Um, but it should be alright after that, and that's the point. But yeah, not delighted, but we've got to do it. In fairness, once we got out, it wasn't too bad. Dad, Dad just thought we needed to go at a, a quarter of 34 was 8.225 and we needed to go at that miles, that miles per hour. But then I said it was 8.5 and we had a big argument and then Dad, and then Dad was like, okay, Mummy, you do it on the calculator and it was 8.5. I don't know what I did wrong, I'm really confused. We need to average 8.5 knots then. I thought we need to average 8.25 over the next four hours. Obviously, I was wrong. Eric is exceptionally good at maths. I don't question his maths. But Hugh questioned his maths and, and lost. So it's about quarter past nine. We just put the jibe in. It's felt a bit of pressure the last couple of hours. I've been hand steering because of the swell being so bad. I have to stop approaching. But the wind is starting to drop now. It's all okay. I feel like we can take a deep breath now. My father, Bill Turner, and a girl that was only after you learned my name that you were free to help. Since that's what I Den in the cockpit for watching Pirates of the Caribbean whilst we're cruising in the Caribbean. Next year we'll watch Pirates of the Caribbean in the Caribbean. Cape La Hague. Alderney. It's going to be weird going back, but nothing will have really changed. We'll get to go and visit everyone. It'll be really cool and exciting. This morning, we, it could have gone either way. I'm really glad that we got our stuff on, went outside, and all of a sudden it didn't seem so bad. It's been a really fantastic experience. Like. At the start, I would not have tolerated being out in these conditions and now I feel absolutely fine in them. It's really interesting how you grow and how you learn and how your experience changes you. But I've got a taste for it now. I want to come back out again next year. I've got to work hard over the winter, make some improvements, make some money, and then come back out and do it again, because it's fun. It's been lots of highs, lots of lows, but ultimately, it's been really, really, really cool. I just realized I made such a mistake and I just looked at my phone again and I double checked the tides. And I knew first tide is going from Belgium to the Atlantic, right? It's going this way, right? Across our left. And then for the second half of the passage, it's going the other way. The tide coming this way is stronger, not only that, if we make six knots, we'll be in this tide for six hours, we'll only be in that tide for four hours. Therefore, we need to make an adjustment because we're going to go further that way through the tide than we are going to come back with the tide. And I just realised, in my very sleepy state last night when I did my final calculation, which was the course to steer, I worked out the drift was going to be approximately six, five, six miles, and I just realised I went the wrong way. For all of you non-sailors, you can't just point the boat in the direction you want to go as you will end up somewhere else. The strength and direction of the tide has to be calculated to give you a course to steer. Think of the tide as a travelator at the airport. In the channel, the travelator goes for six hours in one direction and then switches to the opposite direction for six hours. During our crossing, we estimated that the tide would take us 13 miles west and then approximately nine miles east, meaning that if we'd have gone in a straight line, we would have ended up four miles west of where we wanted to go. To counter this, we plotted a course to steer aka which way we pointed the boat, aka a heading, four miles east of where we wanted to go. So I'm going to make an adjustment right now, which is good, because it actually means we're going to be back on the other tack, it means we may well be on a slightly off the run, which means we have to get the Genoa out as well, which is good news. The other thing we needed to take into account are the shipping lanes. There are two. You look right for the one, and then you look left for the other. The idea is not to get crushed by a massive ship. That passenger ship has definitely changed course to avoid us. I always want to give them a wave and say thanks. This is the busiest I've known the shipping lanes. It's absolutely rammed. Uh, but yeah, that passenger ship's got out of the way. There's two huge tankers. And then this one here is supposed to have something chemicals on it. It's another one. But if you look at the chart, they're just everywhere. 
All in all, we had a great passage, although making tea on passage is never easy. So yeah, made it a fantastic passage. Uh, Esperanto is all put to bed for the night and uh, we're safely on the buoy, anchor lights on and uh, yeah, the kids will be up bouncing on us in six or seven hours time so we can go and get some sleep, hopefully a nice restful one and exciting. We are back in England, so we won't step ashore till tomorrow. <laughs>